Welcome to our lecture from Chapter 7, Section 3. This is our second lecture on standard steel trusses. The first one was on fabrication, and this one has to do with selecting standard steel trusses, or in other words, the procedure for using the tables that are provided by the industry. As in the case of all of our other steel sizing operations, we're going to address both strength and stiffness. Strength will be treated under the full factored load and stiffness will be addressed under live load. This uh, particular video is going to be based on the load and resistance factor design, LRFD, which is typical of most of what appears in the textbook. When the textbook was written, this particular industry did not have an LRFD version of their tables. They only had so-called allowed strength design. And uh, they have recently come out with tables that do uh, the design procedure based on LRFD. And <clears throat> to be as consistent as possible with the rest of the book, this particular video is going to be based on those new tables, the load and resistance factor design tables from this industry. So for the purposes of this subject matter, I encourage you not to go back to the textbook, which is allowed strength design, because as I said, that's all that was available at the time the book was written. And for you to get your information on this particular topic from this video. We're going to deal with um, something called open web steel joists, which I'm going to call K trusses, long span steel joists, which I'm going to call LH trusses, and joist girders, which I'm going to call girder trusses. And I'll clarify the meaning of all those words uh, shortly. So this is what we're basically dealing with. These are standard prefabricated trusses. Well, we call them prefabricated. They are fabricated to order. The industry is organized to do that process really quickly. Um, but they are standardized trusses and they're sufficiently standardized that we can have tables that tell us um, what we can expect in terms of the weight and cost. The standard truss consists of double angle top cord, double angle bottom cord. Uh, we may have solid rods, which by the way, the steel industry calls round bar uh, for the webs. Or as we've indicated earlier, we can have uh, single angle webs or double angle webs. <clears throat> um, the key point here is that for most simple span applications, it's not necessarily to necessary to design all the truss members and connections. Neither the architect nor the engineer of record on the building will do that. There are standard steel truss manufacturers who will choose the material grade, perform the analysis, size the members, size the welds, generate the details, provide specifications, cut the members, lay out the truss, do the welding, and finish the final product. And all that's guaranteed to meet the architectural and structural specifications. So the architect and the engineer will provide uh, the distance uh, that the truss is intended to span, the intended depth of the truss, and the loads, and this manufacturer will deliver a product which is guaranteed to meet those standards. So this is a closer up view. Um, again, showing the solid rod webs, the single angle webs, and the double angle webs in these trusses. All right, so there's a catalog of standard specifications and load tables for steel joists and joist girders. It's published by the Steel Joist Institute, which is a manufacturer's association that sets the industry standard for these products. Um, I'm gonna show just some of the tables, a fairly substantial number of them, but it's not a complete set. So if you want the, the uh, manual, 
that shows huge numbers of details and talks about uh, design situations and how this product's to be used and also the complete set of tables you can go to www.steeljoyce.org. I will say for clarity you'll notice that these are tables for steel joists and joist girders. Uh, again I will use somewhat different language I'll call these steel joist girders and steel truss uh, excuse me steel truss joist and steel truss girders. So um, you'll notice there's a kind of weird language that these people are using where they're talking about joist girders. Now historically a joist was the first member that supports the decking and then the joists were supported by girders and that would be the historical meaning of the language joists and girders. These people got into this process in a certain way and their language is skewed by their historical involvement in the industry. For example, uh, the early uh, trusses were called bar joist because they never fabricated anything except joists. They were all lightweight members. They were all trusses that involved these solid rods or solid bar webs. And I have even seen historical examples, and I'm sorry I don't have a photograph to show you. I know I have taken photographs of them, um, but I can't find them. But the, the really early days, even the bottom cord, which is always double angles today, the bottom cord was two round uh, rods also. Um, so those really early trusses were intended for short spans. They were all intended to be used under fairly light loads, so they were all referred to as joist, and in fact historically they were referred to as bar joist, and over much of my lifetime there's still this tendency of people who've been in the industry for a while to refer to these as bar joist. So this industry came into existence, they named themselves the Steel Joist Institute, and from that moment on it became crucial that they keep, at least for their internal purposes, a consistency in language, which means the word joist is attached to everything. So we end up with something utterly contradictory in terms of the history of the language where we talk about joist girders. Um, talk about utter warpage of the language. So what used to be either a lightweight uh, member that goes immediately under the decking or a more major member that supports those members, uh, now we've blurred them into something called a joist girder. <clears throat> These people's possession of the word joist has become so powerful at this point that the rest of the steel industry has abandoned the, words joist, the word joist and for that matter the word girder as no longer being functionally useful to them in the classic sense of how those terms were defined. So the part of the industry that makes things like wide flange beams for example no longer uses the words joist and girder and in, in my teaching of this subject I'm going to have to get away from those words also because they're very confusing because of uh, usage like this. Um, so the people who make wide flange beams now use the terminology secondary beams, meaning minor beams or lesser beams, and primary meaning carrying higher loads. Okay, so within the tables there are something called open web steel joists. So interestingly enough, before they really formalized all this, they got rid of the term bar joist and they went to the terminology open web steel joist to distinguish themselves at the time <clears throat> from wide flange steel joist and they have a lightweight series which they call the K series which we will mainly use in roofing applications although if you use enough of them they can also be used in flooring applications and I know some engineers who just work all the time out of the K-Trust table uh, because if you use enough of them, um, they work fine. It's just that in floors they have to be really closely spaced. 
typically like two feet apart, which I find to be just a huge jumbled mass of material and it's very difficult to fireproof because you have huge numbers of lightweight members and it's very difficult to get in the blowing material or the equipment to blow the fireproofing material on them. We saw examples of that kind of issue in the World Trade Center where most of the fireproofing got knocked off of the trusses, but uh, the fireproofing was not very effective or complete. And to be honest, if you have fireproofing on trusses and you don't get it over every surface, it doesn't really help you at all. So it becomes crucial that you keep your structure fairly clean in order to um, make the fireproofing work pretty well. <clears throat> They also, I have a long span steel joist, which came along as a new series of heavier uh, trusses than the K trusses. Um, interestingly enough, they dropped the term open web, even though these long span uh, steel joists are still trusses and therefore steel still open web. But to keep the nomenclature simple, they just replaced the term open web with the term long span as opposed to saying long span open web steel joist. This series is called the LH series. <coughs> the L is for long span. Originally there was just an L series, but then they, the industry transitioned from 36 KSI steel to 50 KSI steel. So they added an H. <coughs> for high strength. So now it's the so-called LH series and that's all that anyone in the industry makes. So you might think that we just simplify that after a period of time and go back to calling it the L series. However, you can't really do that because there are a whole bunch of historical buildings out there. They exist in the, in the building stock and occasionally they have to be retrofitted. And so when people go look at the drawings and the drawings sell, say L trusses, you don't want them thinking that those are the equivalent of the modern trusses in this series. So we're going to be holding on to that H forever, even though um, no one makes anything that's not an H series truss at, at this point. These are medium, medium weight uh, medium to heavyweight trusses and we typically will use them in floor applications and the advantage of them over K trusses is that you'll have to have a huge number of K trusses to make up for uh, the fact that they're lower strength so I generally will always use an LH truss in floors even though as I say K trusses can be made to do that fine. There's also a series called a deep long span steel joist um, and then a super long span steel joist. And I think the tables for these go up to about 250 feet. But this industry can make you much longer trusses than that. It's just uh, their market for them is small enough that they don't bother to formalize them in tables. We're not going to deal with either of these particular ones. They're in the catalog and you can get that catalog by going online. But for our purposes, I've grayed these out, meaning we're not going to deal with them in this particular course. And then finally, we have something called, they call them joist girders. As I said, I'm going to call them girder trusses. So here's my language right here. Instead of this K series open web steel joist, I'm going to call them K trusses. These I'm going to call LH trusses and these I'm going to call girder trusses. These are medium weight to heavyweight trusses suitable for girders or primary trusses, if we want to use that terminology, in floor and roof applications. All right, so right here we see the classic example of a truss joist. This is a K truss in a roof, and this is a truss girder. And the way in which we specify these, by the way, is quite different. You'll notice that these truss joists land on a joint in the truss girder. So the truss girder has to be specified very carefully to make sure that it has a joint everywhere that you expect to have a joist landing 
because we can't have our joist landing in the middle of the top cord that will induce too much bending in the member. Um, the second thing that's pretty important is we will specify loads along the joint, uh, the joist, um, the K series, the K truss or the LH truss. We will specify the loads in terms of a distributed load W. In the case of the girder, we're going to specify the load in terms of the magnitude of these point loads that are occurring on these joints. So the tables for these will be um, significantly different in terms of how they're specified. Okay, so here we have another example that just shows uh, a girder. Uh, the distinction here is uh, this girder has a joist landing at every one of these major joints, but not on this strut in between. Um, here is a truss that has a a, a K-series landing not just on these major joints but also over the top of this vertical post. So this vertical post develops a more significant load. In the case of this truss it's actually carrying the weight of this K-truss whereas here all it's doing is bracing this top cord against buckling because in fact there will be no load on this section of top cord because first of all the decking is two and a half inches further up on top of these joists. In other words, this decking never top, touches the top of this girder and the only loads, and I think we can see that here, uh, basically we have the end bearing assembly of this K truss landing on the top of this truss girder and the decking is elevated above the surface of the girder up at the top of the K truss. So we would have no load on the top cord of this and we don't because in fact even this K truss lands on top of this strut. So that vertical strut is carrying the load of that K truss and this K truss and there is no distributed load along the top of the girder. Okay, so as we've done before, we're going to account for deflection in these trusses. And our standard deflection condition that we're always going to start with is the deflection should not exceed L over 360. And for a 30 foot span, that's a one inch deflection. For a 40 foot span, it's a 1.33 inch deflection. And for a 60 foot span, it's a two inch deflection. All right, so. <clears throat> We're going to uh, use the LRFD method, as I mentioned, and for the uh, K-series trusses or K-trusses, uh, here's some overview information. All of them are assumed to be made out of 50 KSI steel um, for the yield strength. Um, black figures in the following table give the total safe factored uniformly distributed load carrying capacities in pounds per foot. The figures in red are the unfactored normal live loads per linear foot of joist which will produce an approximate deflection of 1 360th of a span or in other words L over 360. Um, you can adjust these tables if you want to by saying, okay, well, on some roofs we can tolerate a deflection of L over 140, in which case you can increase the red number by 1.5. Or you can take whatever your live load is and reduce it to two thirds to go scanning through the table. That makes scanning the table easier. In our case, we're not gonna fool around with this L over 240 though. We're going to keep life simple and just do L over 360 the way we have on everything else. So that's background for the table. So we need two pieces of data that are required to go in and search the K-Trust tables. We need the total factored distributed load W, which is 1.2 times W dead plus 1.6 times W live. And then we need W live. And I put it in this format where this is black and comes first and this is red and comes second and I did that because that's the way things are organized in the table and I strongly encourage you and I will make this point over and over again 
write this number first on top and that number below because that's how you're going to see them in the table and you want to avoid your getting confused. <coughs> and by the way, this uh, W self under W dead should include, this W dead rather, should include W self. In other words, you have to account for the weight of the joist in, uh, or the K truss as part of its load, but you don't know what that is before you've sized it. So there's a slight iterative process there. And when I say slight, the reason I say that is because K trusses are typically, and all of these trusses are such a small fraction of the total load on them that you make very little error by just ignoring their self weight. Um, and also though you, you really can't and should not ignore it. But my point is that once you've sized a K truss, the iterative process is very rapid because you're almost exactly at the answer once you get it out of the tables. We'll revisit that point as we go along, but the, the frustrating part with these tables is they do not tell you what is the safe superimposed factored load. You have to account for the self weight of the truss yourself. Okay, so here's a classic uh, K series uh, set of tables. This is an 8K1. So the joist designation is 8K1. The 8 has to do with the depth. These are really, really little trusses, 8 inches deep. You'd wonder why would anybody ever fabricate that when they can get an 8 inch deep wide flange beam. And the answer, by the way, is that these people are using uh, the cheapest kinds of rolled sections, the least expensive ones that we make. They require very modest rolling equipment and they're produced in such staggering quantities that these people can do all the calculations, size all the welds, lay it out, weld it up, and still be cost competitive with wide flanges and in fact typically produce a lighter member. So even for something down around an eight foot span, that's only eight inches deep, um, these will be cost competitive. So somebody makes them. Um, most of the time though, we don't go with something that only spans eight feet. We find some other way to span it, such as with decking, which easily goes eight feet. <clears throat> Nonetheless, the tables contain this. There, there's a, an 8K1, which is a super lightweight, 8 inch deep joist. There's a 10K1, which is 10 inches deep. And by the way, the weight per foot of this is 5.1. The weight per foot of this is 5. So it's not clear what went through their minds or what their thought process was when they did this. It could be they have somebody in their industry that routinely calls for this or routinely calls for that and that that industry is driving these. Um, it's not a particularly interesting question though because we're, we're not going to typically be looking at these really short spans for joists of these sorts because as I said the decking will typically span that far. So we continue up we have a 12 inch deep and now we have three of these which represent different weights and different load carrying capacities. So the lightest one weighs five pounds per linear foot. The heaviest one weighs seven pounds per linear foot. And for comparison purposes, by the way, uh, at a 12 foot span, this 12 inch deep truss can support a factored load of 825 pounds per foot and it only weighs 7.1. So this is to substantiate the point I made earlier, which is that uh, super, um, that the efficiency of these trusses is very high and the self weight is very low compared to what they're able to carry. Okay, so now we have a series of four that are 14 inches deep and they range from 5.2 to 7.7 .7 inches deep. Some, there's a whole series here now of seven of them that are 16 inches deep and they weigh from 5.5 up to 10 pounds.
So the 16 inch deep trusses, and by the way, you'll notice this right here is kind of redundant because the designation always tells us what the depth of it is in inches. But the 16 inches, inch deep K trusses go from 5.5 pounds per foot, which is super lightweight, to 10. So we'll observe a pattern here, by the way. The 8 inch deep, they don't give anything in the tables beyond 16 feet. When we think about it, um, something that is eight inches deep um, and spans 16 feet is L over 24. 16 times 12 divided by eight is 24. So there's never in these tables any truss given that's shallower than L over 24. And that's uh, substantiating our guideline which is, it just doesn't make sense to do trusses any shallower than that. <clears throat> now, this table, by the way, um, was too big to present in one image here. So if you go in the tables, you discover that this continues on down for all the rest of these 16 inch deep trusses, for example. So uh, in the table, it would just continue but what I've done is I've taken off this portion right here and I'm going to put it above uh, the lower portion of that table. So this is continuing on down uh, and some of this is a little redundant like here I stopped at 20. So here's 14 which is 486. So I started at 14 at this point so that we could get as much on this page as we would be able to do within the confines of this particular proportions. <clears throat> so again, um, the eight inch deep stops at 16 feet. The 10 inch is not, does not go beyond 20 feet. Uh, the 12 does not go beyond 24, which again, 12 inch deep truss is one foot deep. It does not span beyond, or they don't give a span beyond 24 because those, that's the shallowest proportion we ever deal with. And by the way, you'll start noticing some pink shading and later on we'll see some blue shading down here somewhere or maybe not for the K trusses. So let's go up and see what it says for the K trusses, uh, things in pink. Well, it doesn't say, so maybe I didn't cut out enough of that. So we'll figure out what pink means. I think though that that means deflection limited because you'll notice it tends to be only for the shallowest of trusses, but we'll see. All right, so the 14 goes, 14 inch deep trusses go to a maximum span of 28 feet. And then the 16 goes to a maximum span of 32 feet. <clears throat> So we can span 32 feet with a 16 inch deep truss, but to go to those long spans for such a shallow truss may require in many instances that we be towards the heavy end here, but we'll see. Uh, here we have 18 inch deep. There's a series from K3 up to K10, which weigh between 6.6 .6 and 11.7 .7 pounds per foot. Then we have some 20 inch deep trusses, which weigh between 6.7 and 12.2. Um, and then 22 inch deep. And when we go here, we see 18 inches will only span up to 36 feet. 20 inches will only span up to 40 feet. And likewise, 22 inches will only span up to 44 feet. So then we have 24 inch deep, 26 inch deep, which these are all tables for those, which again are split in half because we can't get them all on one image. So this is 24 inch deep trusses, and this is 24 inch deep trusses. And the 24 inch deep trusses will span up to 48 feet. The 26 inch will span up to 52 feet. Then we have 28 and 30 finally. So the 30 inch is the deepest K truss they make. And when we go to the lower part of that table, we see it will only span up to 60 feet. 
So that's as far as you can span with K trusses, but that's actually pretty nice because a 60 foot span allows you to do things like use a column grid where you can get parking under your building because the typical double loaded parking um, requires about a 60 foot spacing. So in a very economical way, we're able to develop a very nice span. And by the way, even for office layouts, a 60 foot open span is really nice in terms of giving great flexibility in the arrangement of spaces. So that's the K-Trust series. The K-Trust series is typically either bar webs, um, round bar, or uh, single angle web members. And as we said, it's generally used for roofing situations. Okay, so now we have the so-called long span steel joists, which again are open web. They're all trusses. This is the LH series. Um, here we have a definition of what red means. The red shaded area, um, all this has to do with bridging actually for lateral stabilization. So for what we're doing here, the, the shaded areas of these um, tables are not going to be significant. It's always good to know what they mean, but it has to do with the amount of lateral bracing that's necessary to keep the truss stable. This, by the way, could be important to you in terms of where can you run ductwork? Um, what does this look like visually in terms of the amount of jumble of material that's going on up there. So <clears throat> from an architectural point of view, you may want to know this, but right now we're primarily focusing on structure and we can only do so much. So we're going to sort of gloss over this whole issue of bridging um, or lateral bracing of the trusses, uh, but understand that that is an absolutely important aspect of this. You can't just put one of these trusses up and hope that it's going to remain stable. It needs to be braced to keep it from kicking off to the side. Now, when we go into the LH tables, we need a little more data than we needed before, but again, we need the uh, line distributed load in pounds per foot factored total, which is 1.2 times the line distributed dead load plus 1.6 times the line distributed live load. And we need the live load and we need them in this order with this number above and that number before, below in order to go into this table. In addition to that though, we need another piece of data, which is the total factored load on the truss, not per foot, but just the total, which is gonna be lowercase w times the length. And again, I mentioned that this dead should include self but it's an iterative process. So you have to design it, then you have to account for the self-weight, and then you may have to pick a larger section if it doesn't work. Um, <clears throat> I'll make two comments related to this. This is a useful piece of information because these loads are going to get transferred probably to a girder or some other support, and knowing this total W, uppercase W, which is the total factored load on the uh, truss, allows you to figure out what the support forces are going to be at each end, or in other words, how much force is going to get transport, transferred to the supports. And that in turn, if we're transferring this to a girder truss, allows us to know the force per node on the girder truss. This also is useful because some trusses are deep enough um, and they're heavily loaded enough that they're shear controlled. In other words, we're worried about the failure of web members, which is going to be determined by the reactions at each end of the truss. All right, so the uh, LH table is organized differently before for the K truss we had depth across the top, and now we're going to run depth down the side here. And I'm not quite sure why they made this reorganization. Both the tables work really well though, so you just have to get used to it. So here we have 
uh, 18 LHs um, in various weights from about 10 pounds per linear foot up to about 21. They're all 18 inches deep, which is what the 18 in the designation means. And for trusses of a length between 21 and 24, they're just looking at the total load on the truss, which means safe load in pounds between the two support points. Um, it's implicit that these are controlled by shear failure or web failure. So it doesn't make any difference whether it's 21 feet long or 24 feet long. It's not a moment issue. It's a shear force issue. And if you've designated the full force on the truss, then that tells you, um, what you need to know in terms of the capacity of this truss. Uh, over in this part of the table, it's not shear controlled, it's moment controlled or cord force controlled. And so now we have clear span and feet going from 25 to 36. And here we have the total allowed factored load, 1.2 W dead plus 1.6 W live. And then here we have uh, in red or whatever this pinkish color is, we have the live load that will not exceed a deflection of L over 360. So not surprisingly, the heavy end is able to handle much higher loads than the lighter end. Um, and again, the longer the span of this truss, the lower the load it can support. So a 25 foot version of this can support safely a total factor load of 702 pounds per foot, but a 36 foot one can only handle 367 pounds per foot of total factored load. And likewise, the live load is an even more sensitive issue. The 25 foot truss can handle 313 pounds of live load to arrive at the deflection uh, L over 360, but only 114 pounds per foot will produce that same deflection when it's 36 feet long. So this is a very sensitive variation and typically the longest span trusses are governed by deflection. Here we have an 18 inch deep truss. They only give the table up to 36 feet which again is L over 24. Here we have a 20 inch truss. They only give spans up to 40 feet, which again is a proportion of L over 24. Here we have 24 inch deep LH trusses, which span only to 48 feet, 28 inch, which spans to 56 feet, 32 inch spans to 64 feet, 36 inch spans to 72 feet, 40 inch spans to 80 feet, 44 inch spans to 88 feet, and finally 48 inch spans to 96 feet. So this is pretty amazing. You know, I, a truss joist, excuse me, yeah, joist, uh, or an LH truss um, weighing 21 inch pounds per foot can actually span 96 feet. So this is, this is astoundingly economical kind of construction. And later on, we'll talk about uh, special forms like bow trusses and parabolic arches and things of that sort. Those things are even more efficient. But when you think about it, 21 pounds per foot to be spanning 96 feet. This is astonishing stuff, super economical, uh, super efficient from a structural point of view, which is why you see an immense amount of construction being done with this particular structural model. Okay, so again, um, these are K trusses, two and a half inch deep end bearing assemblies. The LH trusses are typically at least five inches but those land on top of the truss girders. And as we mentioned, the force that's delivered to the truss girders is the crucial thing. So when we get to our table on truss girders, 
or what they call joist girders, they are organized in a different way. So on the left here we have the span, which in this case is 20 feet. And then we have the number of spaces between the joists that are landing on the girders. So if you have two spaces and the span of the girder is 20 feet, then we have one joist landing in the middle of the girder, but the spacing is 10 feet along the top of the girder. We typically don't want to do this, by the way, because remember there's no decking that lands on the girder. The decking is actually on the joist, which is two and a half or five and a half inches above the top surface of, that puts the decking two and a half or five inches above the top surface of the girder. So the girder <clears throat> is not stabilized by the decking. And that means if we have a 10 foot spacing between these vertices on the girder, then the girder is the top cord is not very well braced and we probably don't want that. We've been typically talking about a five foot spacing, which is four spaces for a 20 foot long girder, a five foot spacing between the landing points for the joists. <clears throat> because the joists are connected to the roof decking and the joists are braced by the roof diaphragm action of the roof decking, um, this means that the girder is braced against lateral uh, buckling every five feet. Now you'll notice there are three depths given here, 16, 20, and 24. Um, <clears throat> normally a 16 inch deep joist we could say we could go up to as much as 32 feet, but here we're only at 20 feet. So Typically the truss girders, or what they're calling joist girders, um, are deeper already. Um, and in fact, they go even deeper. So here we have a two foot deep um, joist girder that's only spanning 20 feet. So that's an L over 10 ratio. Um, again, we don't typically go to those kinds of depths, but as we have demonstrated already, if you have the height and volume to your building already for some other architectural purpose, then you would want to go to a 24 inch deep joist uh, girder just to uh, get the efficiency. Um, again, the crucial thing here is the following. Um, <clears throat> four N is four spaces, which means there are three joist landing on this girder and this information up here tells us how much force these trusses can take on each of those key points um, and you'll notice there's a loud uh, strength design in green which we are not using we are using LRFD and these numbers are larger than those because of the factoring effects um, <clears throat> so we're going to go across here and we're going to say for this particular spacing, a 16 inch deep girder that lands every five, uh, has a load every five feet. Um, and if it wants to support six kips of factored load, it will weigh about 16 pounds per foot. These truss girders, by the way, start to be heavier. If you wanted to support 150 kips per foot, you're talking about 314 pounds per foot of truss girder. Um, these are really substantial trusses. Okay, now the manual from the Steel Joist Institute has lots of different girder lengths, but we're just going to do 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, and 90, and 100. And uh, we've left out all the other tables. By the way, down at the bottom here, we have end bearing assembly depths 
for really heavily loaded trusses, the end bearing gets really deep as much as 10 inches. Here we have seven and a half, seven and a half, and the rest of them will be five if it doesn't say otherwise. <clears throat> All right, so basically this is everything you need to know to go size the joist, truss joists and truss girders, and the truss joists might either be K trusses in the roof or LH trusses in the floor. Um, and the girders are pretty much independent of your application. Uh, it's just whatever your application is, there's a wide range of, of forces that are designed for everywhere from six kips up to 150. Okay, so that concludes our introduction to the procedures for using tables. And this is kind of an overview. And you'll notice along the way we talked about strength in terms of ability to resist full factored load. Um, and we talked about sizing for stiffness. And by the way, you'll notice we didn't make any distinction between those two for truss girders. And that's because they are typically deep enough that they're not controlled by deflection. And so we just go straight from what is the factored force that they have to resist. But we dealt with K trusses, LH trusses, and girder trusses. And we didn't go through an example, but we're going to do that next. So this was intended as an overview to sort of introduce you to what sort of, of tables exist and what the general nature of those tables are. And now in order to really fully understand how they're used, we're going to do an example. <clears throat>